Now we're turning right now to discuss specifically what our corporate partners are doing to drive gender equity and diversity. As we talked earlier today, we've got 57 women's business organizations and resource partners. We've got over 30 corporate partners. We've got 420 champions within the movement. And we wanna talk about what we're all doing together what we're doing in terms of targets, what are the best practices and where we're going. So in order to do this and to hear from some of these, I want to introduce Felicity Hassan, who is the president of North America for Adelis. She is a WBC board member and chair of the advisory council. Felicity, take it away. Thank you so much, Gwen. Good morning. I now have the great fortune to speak with five companies who are leading the charge. Uh, as Gwen mentioned, my name is Blissy Hassan. I'm the president of Ordellis, an executive search firm specifically dedicated to leveling the playing field for diverse talent, both in the leadership space and in the boardroom. Uh, I also have the great honor of working with, uh, with the board of the Women Business Collaborative and co-chairing their advisory council. I am so pleased to be hosting five incredible executives today who all believe in our core message of empowering through gender diversity and are here to share how they and their organizations um, are representing and leading the charge in this space. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves, their role and company and why diversity is so important to them. So let's start with Amy. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Amy Lenander. I lead the consumer auto business at Capital One. And regarding uh, DEI, I mean, I, I just fundamentally believe that we're able to create the best solutions and innovations when we create an environment where people from different backgrounds and experiences just feel comfortable to contribute their best thinking. I mean, that's the environment I feel best being a part of. And I believe that you only get there with an intentional focus on DEI. Thank you, Amy. And Kristen? Yes, good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here. Uh, I am Vice President of Government Relations at NetApp, probably the biggest company you might not have heard of. Uh, 18 billion market cap, it's B2B. Anything data, that's NetApp. Uh, I came to NetApp actually being a consultant with them for a couple of years. I had my own woman-owned business for 13 years. I was the CEO, ran my P&L, and uh, NetApp convinced me to come on board to run their program after I built it on the outside. The reason I joined NetApp, among many reasons, but actually the most important reason is because their culture, their values, their priorities, and DI and B aligned with my own. And I felt I could really move a needle both within the company, help move forward their own program, as well as externally through the government affairs program. So delighted to be here. And I'm super happy to be able to brag about all the cool stuff we're doing at NetApp. Thank you, Kristen. And Tony? Hi, I'm Tony Cook-Bush. I'm the global head of government relations at News Corporation. Think of us as Wall Street Journal, Harper Collins, New York Post, and Realtor.com. Um, I'm committed to DE&I for many reasons. One, just my personal experience of having come up in an environment where I was often the only African-American and the only woman in a room and meetings, you know, whatever I was doing. But second, because it is critical to our businesses. Uh, DEI is important, diversity, equity, and inclusion is important for the newspaper business, for the real estate business, for book publishing, because we need to be able to reach a broad audience and pre present diverse viewpoints. And that can only happen if that's the kind of company that we are. Fantastic. Nan. Hi, I'm Nandas Gupta. I'm a senior partner and managing director at the Boston Consulting Group. We are a global strategy consulting group. And I have to say, it's just a pleasure to be on this panel with such like-minded individual and kindred, kindred spirits, if you will. So DE&I is important to my organization at BCCG to start with. I mean, it's part of our core values over 55 years ago when we were founded, diversity, inclusion, respect for the individual and social impact. And for us, Tony, just as you said, it's a business imperative. We do better work if we can bring great, diverse individuals who feel included and be at their best 
in everything that we do. And for me personally, it fuels a lot of my purpose to help advance that cause and make sure we're the best that we can be. And I and my teams are at the best that we can be. Thank you, Nan. And last but by no means least, Larry. Hi, Larry Quinlan. I just wrapped up a long stint as Global Chief Information Officer of Deloitte and I'm a partner uh, in the firm. This is all about preserving our firm. We believe without a an effective approach to DEI without an effective approach to the advancement retention of women, uh, we're at a competitive disadvantage and our longevity is threatened. This is about survival from my point of view. Yeah, I think a great point. And I think I think you all reflected that. I think what we're talking about here is really uh, kindred spirits, understanding that, that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is a strategic imperative to everything that we do as individuals, but specifically in the corporate and business space. So without further ado, I want to dig into that in a little bit more depth. So I think we can all agree that, that DEI and B has never been more top of mind. And, and we applaud all of you and the organizations that you represent for really leading the way in terms of driving diversity, but particularly gender equity. So I, I believe that these changes can be organic. And by organic, I mean, you know, some of these, some of these changes can evolve over time. Um, and then there's also the opportunity for us to introduce more programmatic changes to really kind of show intentionality. And so what I was hoping to do in the first instance, just in the context of like us having gone through such a dramatic 18 months of change, is to really think about some of those organic shifts that we've seen within our organizations and how our organizations just jumped on board and got things started before the program started to kick in. So Tony, I'd love to kind of just hear a little bit more about, about how News Corp started, started evolving and what you started seeing. Thing, I would say the biggest change, um, you know, that has happened at News Corp really since um, COVID hit us was a dramatic increase in communications. Um, we found that it's really important to communicate more with our employees. You know, for my team, we actually have a daily meeting. At first, everybody was like, oh, we don't really want to do that now. You know, it's just a part of our day. The senior executive team, we're having town meetings. But, you know, communication has been really critical as we move forward and, and um, making sure that, I think one of the things about COVID is that we have learned um, the fragility of our relationships um, and um, the importance of being in touch and communicating. And so communicating your policies around diversity, equity, inclusion, but also um, uh, not just communicating them, but talking to employees, you know, making sure those policies are evolving as we've moved into this new environment. Absolutely. And I know that, um, that, that Amy, you had talked about like the shifting nature of like the way in which you're communicating with, em with employees. I'd love for you to expand on, on that as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, building on Tony's point, I completely agree that communication just became so much more important organically as we all move to work from home. Um, but I, I think a, a piece of that also is just that the more the more context we shared with the broad team, the more they craved. And the more that we saw into each other's homes and saw really in live and real time the challenges that our colleagues were managing through, whether that's you know a persistent toddler or the need to manage how you work from a small bedroom with roommates, just different sorts of conversations emerged. And those sorts of conversations were when it was much more frequent to ask, like, how are you really doing? And not just get a cursory answer, but actually get a very genuine answer. And I think those more personal interactions and caring across our business just made the team feel more included and supportive of different circumstances that, that everyone was managing. I, th I think it also created a foundation for deeper conversations in both small and large groups about mental health, and especially last summer when there was so much life-changing momentum in the world around us with the Black Lives Matter movement, 
like that foundation of trust and support that organically was built early in the pandemic made it much more natural to lean into conversations about what could feel like a much more personal topic. Um, and I, I think a lot of those really critical conversations about like the impact of the killing of George Floyd or the impact of uh, hate crimes against Asians, like those conversations and ultimately our urgency to act were really fueled by those deeper connections that were forged early in the pandemic. Yeah, and, and I'd love to kind of touch on that uh, in, in more depth later as well. But I think I think that what, what we're talking about here when, when you're talking about those personal conversations is actually kind of really a fundamental shift of, of culture and values uh, within our organizations. And, and I know that that's something which kind of NetApp really kind of dug into, Kristen. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, and I certainly agree with all the comments that have been made so far. They're all applicable to NetApp as well. Um, I think uh, what we realized most during COVID, most importantly, was that we just really need to take care of our people. Um, in this new strange world in which we all found ourselves, um, we need to make sure our team felt taken care of, that they had what they needed to do their jobs and had the emotional and personal support to do so. Um, we needed them to be healthy and well and to continue our corporate growth mindset. It was a full package. So we kind of stepped back and we took a look at our values and we decided they needed a refresh. The old values, we just didn't think they addressed the shifts in culture and behaviors that were needed to reflect our vision, which was to ensure our people felt taken care of, to ensure we inspired their growth mindset, to capture new opportunities and more directly reflect our strong focus on belonging, focus on belonging and inclusion. Uh, we had a global all hands call recently and George Curry and our CEO really said it best. He said, building an aspirational culture at NetApp is a choice that we all must make. It means aspiring to bigger things, rising together, promoting belonging, embracing growth, acting like owners and moving with confidence, purpose and accountability. It's a choice we much make, must make each and every day. And I think that verbiage is really, really important. So leading with caring, leading with intention, leading with clarity and leading with authenticity because that's what NetApp actually was already all about. So the five values refreshed are put customer at the center. We're still a business after all. So that comes first. Number two, care for each other and our communities. Number three, build belonging every day. Every day, that language is very important in there. Embrace a growth mindset and think and act as owners because we're all in this together, wherever we're sitting in our living rooms or apartments or wherever, as you said. <laughs> um, as Edie said yesterday at the opening of the conference, if you have the right culture, you'll get great recruitment, great retention of great talent. And that's really our goal. So we try to capture all of kind of this new movement in our values more accurately. Speaking my language, uh, Nan, BCG, I know that you had kind of touched on like culture change in your introduction. And what, what are BCG thinking about in terms of like that organic, that evolution of, of culture and values? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting way to frame it, Felicity, because for us, um, gender equity has been a, a mission, something we've been working on for well over 20 years. And we recognized early on that a lot of that wasn't going to need programmatic things to change. But a lot of that was actually just making sure our culture was as inclusive as possible and really set an environment for success up for all diverse individuals. So for us during COVID, I mean, what we learned quickly, and I would echo all of the comments of, of the how to do this is like double down on the culture that defines us, double down on what makes our environment as caring, as empathetic, as psych psychologically safe, because people need that more than ever. And women have needed it more than ever through, you know, <laughs> the circumstances of the pandemic. I think we've all, you know, seen in the data, women really need to be understood you know, to be considered more fully for their whole lives, to really feel purpose in their work. Um, so we've just doubled down on communications, on making sure people had a lot of visibility into the resources and the support that were in place for mental wellness, uh, and that people felt not just, you know, able to take advantage of those things, but welcome to, encouraged to, and felt that, you know, people had their back. Uh, we've created a lot of forums for conversations. So conversations for people to sort of talk about their 
authentic experiences, their authentic backgrounds, so that those of us who are struggling to understand some of the turmoil that's going on in the world have a way to learn from each other and sort of air our questions and learn with complete safety of knowing you won't be judged. We're all going through something. Let's go through it together. So it's really just been doubling down on making sure that what's always been there in all culture was really felt through this crisis. Uh, fair enough. And, and, and Larry, I'm sure like a lot of that resonates with, with what you're doing as well. Anything that you would add to these comments on like culture, values, communication? I completely agree. And I would say the only thing I would add is this organic recognition that people are different. And it sounds like a cliche, I know, but mm. it, it really gets pronounced in a pandemic. Some people really want to get back into the office. You know, we, sometimes we have this notion nobody wants to go to the office. We have a lot of young people who really miss that. We have people who really want to get back out on the road. They want to get on a plane. They want to visit clients. They want to do those things. And then there, there are others uh, who are not. So, you know, we ask the question a lot, when are we opening offices? When are we going to do this? How are we going to handle work from home? And very often I say it's our recognition now that, yes, you have to ask those questions, but they're not always the right questions. Some people are going to be at home, some are going to be at client sites, some are going to be uh, in the office, and those who are in the office on Monday and Tuesday might be home on Thursday and Friday. So we just have to prepare for all of those eventualities and figure out how we're taking care of people and business, given that all of those eventualities are just going to be true. Yeah, I think that's I think that's so true. And I think that speaks to every it speaks to everything that we've talked about today. And I'm really kind of like hones in on the point that you made, I think, I think Amy and you, Tony, which was really like, this is about, it's so much more about the person now than the employee. This is about, this is about people, which doesn't mean that we were kind of inhumane leaders historically, but more so that just like we really learned what people are about now. So kind of understanding people on a more personal level is really going to probably drive progress. So with that, I'll, I'll pivot over to, we've looked at like gradual evolution, but I know that your organizations are also putting in place like really cool, like macro programmatic changes to create like intentionally inclusive cultures for all. And some of them have been like really dramatic. Um, so Kristen, I would love for you to, to, to kick us off with, with NetApp and some of their real estate decisions. Sure. So I think the biggest one you're alluding to, Felicity, is that we've uh, gotten rid of our old school headquarters in Sunnyvale, the whole campus thing that we had for a long time. And we bought some office space in San Jose that we're totally refitting for kind of the workforce of the future, if you will. Um, instead of having a lot of offices, it has a lot more collaboration space. So that's one of the programmatic changes. Another one I would highlight, which is closely connected, is something that we call Thrive Everywhere. So it's a very fluid approach to Larry's point of how do you view the office going forward? Um, some folks will work primarily remote and I say primarily on purpose, it's not 100% remote. Some people will be primarily in the office um, and the vast majority will be flex workers. The most important piece is that is based on what work needs to be done, not metrics of two days in the office or FaceTime or whatever. It's what's the work that has to be done and where does that work What's the work that has to be done and where does that work have to be done from? Um, and the idea of the flexibility and choice that this hybrid work model offers, along with aligning to those revised values that I talked about, the point is to enable every employee to thrive everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are, you're still going to be able to thrive in our environment. And I think another programmatic change I would point out is uh, an intercompany platform we've stood up, which is kind of like an opportunity marketplace kind of like an internal LinkedIn almost sort of where uh, employees go in and put in their qualifications, their skill sets, things they're interested in. They're allowed to proactively look at building their own skill sets out in different areas. There's a whole transparency across the whole organization, no matter where you sit, what color you are, what gender you are, as to where the opportunities are. You can find mentors and coaches through doing that. So um, it puts everyone on an equal footing for having transparency across the company to find and apply for opportunities, develop themselves, and work with others proactively to achieve the career they want to have at NetApp. So 
those are some pretty cool tools that we've put in, uh, again, aligning with those values that we've kind of shifted to, to represent both our internal culture as well as the changing marketplace. So kind of cool stuff. I'm very excited about see how they all work. Yeah, and I mean, it really is super intentional. So incredibly impressive to be making those kind of bold steps, which are, you know, are, are, are big financial decisions, like really kind of focus on, on productivity and access for all, which again, like speaks to that belonging, that inclusivity, and like in this changing world, how do we kind of make sure that people stay included? And while we're on the topic of, of like HQs, um, I know that Larry, we had touched on historically that HQs have always been kind of almost less of an issue for you in your business because of like the nature of travel. So from your perspective, what kind of programmatic shifts have you have you kind of looked into really to kind of make sure that your clients are really kind of seeing seeing ongoing effectiveness? Sure. So we've always been a people business and uh, and but a high travel business as well. So programmatic shifts around how we travel ensuring that the needs of our people are considered in travel assignments. So in our systems, actually enabling people to identify what their travel and location preferences are, just given this new normal we find ourselves in. Uh, there's a decision around bringing people together in Deloitte University that we think is actually still important. So the notion that that's just going to go away and all learning is going to be virtual and no one will come together anymore, we don't believe in that. Uh, we actually believe that uh, in the right circumstances with the right precautions, uh, that it, it absolutely makes sense. And Deloitte University, for example, is an important element uh, of our plans going forward. But we also believe in being intentional and in looking at all of our talent life cycle systems. So looking at performance evaluations and appraisals and really ensuring that diversity, equity, inclusion, well-being are factored into those items and that we're being transparent and deliberate about it. Fantastic. And, and in that, in the, in the spirit of that kind of data analytics, which has always been absolutely pivotal, but I'd say ever more so in this kind of remote and digital environment, um, Amy, how's Capital One like leaning into, into the data? Yeah, well, at Capital One, I think we always lean into the data um, yeah. in, in everything we do. Uh, but that, that very much applies to our diversity efforts as well. Um, and when I, I think that came to the fore when uh, we launched a major program of work programmatically, uh, the Capital One Racial Equity Initiative um, in August 2020. And a big piece of that was measuring the impact. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but the, the purpose of what we were trying to stand up was really to advance racial equity and grow diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Capital One and in our communities. And we looked you know, across the gamut at associate development and recruiting to evaluating our talent systems and talent brands and uh, DIB learning, supplier diversity, um, and even looking outside our four walls of our business, our four very virtual walls right now, um, to our community impact and even fueled an impact initiative that was a $200 million five-year commitment to advance socioeconomic mobility. Um, and the key with, with all of those is it's not just standing up a big program of work with a lot of visibility, uh, but with that also coming the accountability and programming infrastructure that enables and monitors and reports on progress. Um, I mean, I can't do justice to all of the work in that effort, but I, I think it was really important to us as a company to develop something programmatic that spanned across the whole of the company, as we know that sustained systematic impact only happens when it's fully integrated and embedded everywhere. Yeah, and I think I think like you know really kind of leaning into those into the the data and analytics as you say, particularly in the remote environment, has just been so incredibly important. And when I think about you know the the impacts of of the past eighteen months and some of kind of the data that we've seen coming out of that is that is that you know something which is very close to our hearts on on this call and in this summit is is about gender equity and we've seen women falling out of the the workforce at a far higher rate. Um, you know, Nan. 
you know, BCG did, did some fascinating exploration into, into specifically that topic about why women are falling out. And I'd love for you to kind of take us through that. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I love to talk about this. So when you talk about programmatic change, um, I, as I said, this has been a 20 year strategy for us, a 20 year focus for us. Um, but we have put several programs in place. The one that has made, in my opinion, the single biggest impact is what we call segment of one. So unrelated to COVID, although I can pull it back to how we've deployed the program in, in recent times, you know, we did some seminal analysis about seven, eight years ago to really ask ourselves the question, really get to the data if you will, the root of the question, why were women opting out of the consulting career at a certain stage, if you will, of, of progress, which was for us around the project manager, project leader time. And I think at the time, you know, the myth was, the prevailing wisdom was, well, women opt out at that time because the travel becomes inconvenient and, you know, they're building their families and, you know, it just doesn't work. And when we did the data and analysis, when we talked to the women, when you actually compared reasons why men leave versus women versus why women leave, we actually found that that was a factor, but it wasn't the defining factor that made the difference between the levels of attrition between men and women. The defining factors were far more nuanced. And one of the most important factors was at a certain stage in you know, the consultant's lifetime and a consultant's career, relationships really matter professional relationships, feeling like someone has your back, feeling like you're part of someone's team, feeling like someone is really gonna help you continue this career and develop yourself as a professional. And that was a big gap between men and women. Women were not forming those relationships as naturally. You know, we can all you know, understand the reasons why. And we needed to be super intentional about figuring out, getting under the hood, how can we help that happen? How can we catalyze that relationship forming? So we started the program of segment of one. It's been, you know, seven or eight years now. And what we essentially do is we look at our entire pipeline of women, you know, approaching that, that career stage and asking the question, do we see the conditions for success there? You know, there's, of course, you know, a need to develop on the skill set, but are the relationships forming? You know, do we see the conditions for sponsorship? And does someone have this person's back? Are they being well known enough or are they slipping through the cracks? And we've been doing this now consistently every six months, every single woman at that career stage with all of the leaders that have influence on those things. So in the practice areas and in the systems and the offices. And I'm super proud to say that it's been five years running, we've completely equalized the level of retention at that career stage through this super intentional programmatic effort. Um, so this remains, of course, through, through the latest time, as you said, we all know that there are a lot of reasons why women might be questioning work right now and, you know, opting out. And we've just sort of doubled down on those efforts and made sure that we're keeping a really expansive view of what, what can we do essentially to support women through this time. Fantastic. And it's always really encouraging to kind of take a, take a look and actually do the analysis on some of those assumptions that we make. As you say, like life stages, of course, are going to be a factor in terms of in terms of women kind of dropping out of the workplace. But it's really kind of understanding a little bit more about like, again, it comes back to those points that I think that we've all made about access, about understanding the person and like really kind of understanding, as Larry put it, the individual, we are all individuals, like rather than kind of like clubbing it all as like all women are falling out because like their life stage and they're looking after children is simply not the case. You know, really kind of understanding and doing that analysis. And I think some of the programs that we've heard from all of you are really exciting. Tony, anything that you would add in terms of the programs that have been introduced over at News Corp that you'd like to highlight? Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, I would like to just um, comment and it's kind of something I think for people to think about um, or, you know, just to follow up on on where we are. You know, one of the things I've thought about the experience we've had with COVID is whether or not it's benefited some women. And it'll be interesting to see the studies that come out. I mean, there's been a lot of reporting of women dropping out of the workforce. But, you know, one question I had was whether more senior women have found COVID to be an advantage to them because a lot of the issues around balancing, you know, family and work, you know, relationships are those things that have been, have they been easier to manage 
um, during COVID. Um, and so that's just something that I think will be interesting to see what happens. I do feel like for me and for a number of my colleagues, they found it was almost an opportunity to like relax a little bit um, be, and really focus on work in a way that they hadn't been able to before. So that'll be something to see. But going back to the, the question at hand um, with News Corp, um, again, you know, we have um, uh, very distinct businesses and because our businesses are geographically um, dispersed, primarily in Europe, the US and Australia, you know, News Corp had operated in a very decentralized manner. And as we've moved forward on addressing DEI, one of the things we've done is to centralize our activities in that space. And I think it's having a really positive benefit of having the ability to one, lessons learned from those parts of our businesses that are doing better, whether it's on gender or others might be on diversity, um, but also, you know, creating um, uh, metrics. Um, and that I think is having a, a huge impact. You know, for us, you know, I, I do believe DE and I is an issue that's really um, led by leadership. And, you know, our senior exec team is already 50% uh, female. Um, and so that sends a lot of messaging directly to the business units um, just in and of itself. And I think leading by example, you know, um, is one of the most important things. I couldn't agree more. I definitely, the messaging needs to needs to come from the top and leading from example is, is leading by example is incredibly key. Um, but I think also, I think what, what all of us have seen is that there was, there's perhaps been a historical reluctance to, to move towards measurable goals. And now I feel like we're beginning, we're all beginning to embrace the concept of measurable goals to be able to really kind of reflect our intentionality in this space. Um, so, so with that, I want to kind of dig in a little bit more depth into how leveraging these diversity programs is helping to drive that scalable and sustainable change. So really kind of leaning into those metrics that we that we have placed uh, on our organizations. And, you know, for me, obviously, coming from 20 years in recruitment, uh, my thoughts are always, you know, the most measurable component uh, of, of all of these programs is talent. Um, so, so Larry, how has talent acquisition been held accountable for for some of for sustaining some of these changes from a diversity perspective at Deloitte? You're so right that for a long time there's been the reluctance to think about outcomes, numbers, <laughs> hold ourselves accountable, and and that has changed. So, from a talent acquisition standpoint we have deliberately expanded the schools that we work with. We've dramatically expanded them. We want to ensure that we can find the right talent where it exists, not just in the traditional places uh, that, we have, uh, that we have looked for that talent. We're holding ourselves responsible for not just going to those schools, but being successful at those schools. Can't just say, ah, we try, uh, let's move on. Uh, actually holding ourselves accountable. And that means numbers, looking at the number of students uh, we've interviewed, the number of students we've made offers to, looking at their retention, looking at their promotions and really being uh, truly intentional about that. All of our businesses, are now holding themselves and being held accountable for results, for talent acquisition results, for retention results, looking at the performance uh, life cycle, the entire talent life cycle, and no longer being uncomfortable about talking about those things and about ensuring that we have equity in the talent life cycle process. And finally, being transparent. That discomfort you referenced resulted in a lack of transparency. And now we have the transparency reports that lay out in, uh, in gory detail <laughs> exactly how we're doing and the commitments we're making to do better. 
Fantastic. And Kristen, I know that that's an approach that your your TA team has taken as well in terms of just like expanding uh, that reach. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's one that we really need to do because in the tech industry, our data, and we're all about data at NetApp, is probably worse than most, right? If you're talking about women in tech, only about 29% of the workforce, the higher you get, the executive level, only about 10%, right? So we've got a real challenge to, to meet here. Uh, we have actually taken on some pretty significant metrics and goals ourselves. In fact, we're committed to reach gender parity at all levels, no later than 2035. And that's an actual goal we've set for the organization. So to work on that, as you're alluding to, we've reached out in a number of different areas, um, starting with the younger folks, uh, teenagers 12 to 16. We have a program called the Data Explorers Program that we've rolled out in under-resourced communities across the globe to bring in young people and talk about data careers and learning about what data is, and the cloud and all these cool, new, exciting topics uh, to reach the young women and right, the young people of color that may not have thought about these types of careers. Uh, at the university level, and this touches my day job very closely, we are working very closely with HBCUs. Uh, we have a pretty heavy recruiting program across the HBCUs, uh, internships, full-time careers, uh, challenge, tech challenges at North Carolina and Tech, for example, or A&T University, for example. And last week we announced we have joined the HBCU Partnership Challenge with the HBCU Caucus. So we're working with the folks in Congress, in my day job, to figure out how we move this needle forward. And our colleagues at the White House, with President Biden, number two of his priority is diversity and inclusion. So NetApp is really taking this all uh, company approach to seeing how do we move these, these needles forward and how do we change this data? Because we really need to do so. So all hands on deck. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And Nan, tell us a little bit more about how BCG have addressed that people process as well. You know, I think this is such an important uh, thing to discuss, right? Because it's one thing to, to do programs, to set goals, to hold yourself account, but how do you sustain the change? You know, make sure it's, it's part of the machinery rather than something you're constantly poking and prodding on and reminding people. So the sustainability, I think, comes down to being bold, as, as, as Larry said, you have to be courageous, right? You have to be actually willing to challenge. How have we done things in the past? And are we willing to actually change the way we've done things in the past? Because they may be biased. There may be real biases in there that prevent us to really achieving our goals on diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, so it takes a lot of courage and it also takes the willingness to do the heavy lifting. It takes work to really, you know, rethink your processes, rethink how we would do that. So I think we've talked already on the panel a lot about the acquisition front of things. When we think about sort of the development side of things and the people process, the promotion things, we spent quite a bit of time really looking at, are we developing people in ways that actually have bias in them? And a great example of something that, that we found is that, you know, when we did this analysis, women were prone to get more developmental advice, you know, constructive feedback, grow in this area on the communication side. And we found that we often found, you know, some common themes like, you know, lean in more or take up more space at the table or, you know, be more assertive. And, and candidly, when we really looked at the range of styles that you need to be successful as a strategic advisor, as a consultant, it wasn't all about being the loudest voice in the room. We just had developed this pattern recognition of that's what good looks like. That's what it means to be a leader without fully recognizing that actually what it takes is excellent listening empathy. Sometimes the side one-on-one -on -one conversation is even more influential, makes more change happen than being the loudest voice in the table. So we had the guts to sort of rip apart the way we used to describe communication skills and that competency and rewrite it, actually talk about that full range of communication skills and teach our leaders and our advisors, our career development advisors, to recognize that broader skill set and appreciate that actually different styles can work super well. What matters is the outcome and are people adept or not at a good range in order to actually get to the right outcome so okay. it's a good example of like you got to do the work actually and you got to be courageous enough to challenge the way you used to think about it and maybe reframe uh, the way to think about it going forward and hey it's intimidating right and this is something that we talk about with with our clients a lot like as you say like 
changing the inputs to get different outputs is can be like a really intimidating process but i've always interviewed this way this is how we this is how we've always done it this has always been successful for us in the past why would we change it but you make such a good point it's about like being bold and making those changes which reduce the bias that we might have seen historically in order that we can kind of really make a sustainable shift um and and really kind of thinking about like intentionally changing the diversity of our organizations and and that kind of really speaks to you know the retention component um and when i think about retention i'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about um about what news call are doing tony when when you think about like right okay the, the you know these individuals are in our organization now we've really kind of like made some changes in terms of like how we're sourcing and making sure that we've got diversity sort of landing in our organizations like, how do we then think about, like, how are News Corp then thinking about, like, retention? Well, one of the things that we've been doing, and as we, as I talked about, one is sort of centralizing our process so that we are gathering the important data that other companies had been doing before us. Um, but the second thing is asking our employees, like what they want, what are the issues that are important to them? Because it's really interesting the kind of feedback feedback you get. You know, increasingly employees are interested in what you're doing around um, sustainability and the environment. You know, they want programs like that. What kinds of things they want to be more involved in philanthropy. They may say we want specific training to, you know, move into different kinds of roles and then developing programs to respond to those specific needs. And I think it, you know, again, goes back to the communication and having a two way street of hearing from your employees what matters, what's going on. I think the kind of data, um, the changing data we're seeing about what women want, what diverse employees are looking for, that it's really critical that the lines of communication are open so that you're addressing them because it's very different for an organization that's primarily made up of journalists than an organization that is primarily a digital like realtor.com, which is, you know, primarily a digital organization. I mean, we have different needs. And so we found that um, better communications both ways from our employees is what's made the difference um, and is helping us with retention. Thanks, Tony. And the other thing which I think is has has become you know really front and center as we look at kind of like the 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 mental and the emotional impacts of of the situations that we've been in over the course of the past eighteen months, um, how people have been personally impacted by the BLM movement, how people have been personally impacted by by COVID. We often think about you know mental health and wellness, which I think is you know critical in terms of the psychological safety required to return to work. Um, I know that that's, that's been certainly on the minds over at Capital One, Amy, anything that you want to share about, about things that you're doing in that space? Uh, sure thing. Um, yeah, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just creating a more psychologically safe environment for associates to share like what they're feeling and what they need, uh, I think has been a big move towards inclusion for us. And I, I think on the psychological safety front, it's not only um, talking about things like uh, like those big issues that have hit us from the outside, but also I think we've realized how important that is for retention of of women and other underrepresented groups in in the company overall, but also in sort of those positions of power. Because um, one of the things we've really thought about is as we think about driving sustainable change to get higher representation of women in those like core senior PL roles, we've realized that we need to make like the pipeline up leading up to those roles feel like a place where they want to be, where they feel safe to bring their whole selves to work. And uh, and the community in that in that space actually. Uh, embraces them in that. And, and to get to that sort of result, uh, to, to Nan's point earlier, it just takes a lot of work. It's a lot of like small cultural changes that we need to look not at, not necessarily just helping the women along that, but helping the group that's a predominantly group of men understand how some of the small things they might be doing or ways that they've made decisions over time have 
maybe created an environment that doesn't feel as psychologically safe. Um, and I think we've realized that, again, it's hard work over time uh, to get folks to realize the changes that need to happen. But once they do, like that's really the sort of change that's more likely to be sustainable over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some really powerful thoughts here. And I think, you know, from from the organic shifts that your organizations have taken through to the more macro programmatic investments that have made that have been made in diversity, which have really kind of led you into measurable, uh, measurable goals and objectives in this space are incredibly impressive. Like we've, we've touched on like the human component, you know, the increase in communications and transparency, the education, the empathy that's required to really shift on this. In one word, because I know that we are nearing our final minute, in one word or one thought, like what's your call to action? Amy, kick us off. Continue the work. Like this is it's sustainable. It, it's it's going to take a while for this to be sustainable, but we all need to just continue the work in this space. Absolutely. Kristen? I would say together. Uh, no one can do this alone, and it's got to be at all levels and with all intentions and joined at the hip. So I think together would be my word. Thank you. Tony? Engagement, um, which I think is following up. I think that being and being personally engaged because each person can make a difference. Thank you, Nan. I would say let's seize the day. We have this incredible opportunity and time to reinvent the way work works and make it more equitable for women. Let's let's not waste that. Let's let's think boldly, innovatively when we come back to work. Larry. I'd say you gotta believe. That's gotta be the foundation. If you're just doing it to check the box, but you secretly believe that women aren't as good in technology or something like that, you're going to fail. you got to believe. Thank you, Larry. And thank you to our incredible panelists and for WBC for shining a light on this incredible topic. Thank you all. Over to you, Gwen. At NetApp, we've taken a data-centric approach to building our pipeline of women leaders. This year, we not only increased our leadership development opportunities, but we saturated the available seats with women. 